welcome to the inaugural episode of Australia Censored. I'm your host, John Storey, Director of Law and Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs. Today's guest is Professor James Allen, Garrick Professor of Law at the University of Queensland. And I couldn't think of a better person to kick this series off than someone who has been such a free speech crusader, especially in respect to our university campuses. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you, John. Uh, it's nice to be here. Great. Well, I thought we'd kick off by talking about the government's proposed new uh, misinformation laws, the Communications Legislation Amendment Combating Misinformation and Disinformation Bill. Now, the, the Australian Communications Minister, Michelle Rowland, at a press club address said she's committed to introducing this bill into Parliament um, early next year. And she said that doing nothing in respect to misinformation is not an option. Um, before we get into it, how, do, how does this bill, how is it intended to work in practice? Well, I think to be uh, bipartisan here, we have to remember that the original idea, disgracefully, was the Liberal Party's idea. Paul Fletcher, during COVID, thought this would be a good idea, the geniuses in the Liberal Party. And they, it was largely because they didn't like the fact that uh, regular citizens were pointing out that uh, the Morrison government's handling of COVID was basically a disaster. And so the original idea, and this is a disgrace, came from the Liberal Party. Uh, they lost government, and I, I actually was glad that Morrison lost. I have to say, I, I thought he was a disgrace as prime minister. Man doesn't understand free speech. Um, having said that, the labor iteration of this bill is worse. Um, I would like to see Mr. Uh, Dutton draw a line with the past and just come out and say, if this bill passes, we will repeal it come what may, even if it's a yeah. double dissolution. So basically, um, there are, lot, there are so many problems. Here are some basic ones. Um, it exempts any information that's produced by government. It exempts stuff that comes out of the legacy press and the universities. So in other words, the elite um, sort of set of understandings of the world that you might link to a Guardian journalist, that's all exempted from any claims as to misinformation or disinformation. Um, another problem is the bill is premised on this idea that we can know what the truth is. If you go back to COVID, Stanford, and he's one of the top five epidemiologists in the world, but Jay Bhattacharya said, um, let me get the quote right, I looked it up. Uh, Governments have been the most important and most damaging source of COVID misinformation during the pandemic. So the elite sort of mouthpieces got just about everything wrong. These would be the people who are exempted under this bill. You can imagine, you know, John Stuart Mill rolling in his grave. So how do you identify what truth is? And the bill is sort of tricksy. It's sort of, it's not, we got this regulatory body. And effectively what this bill does is has the executive regulating speech. And they got this body and they say, we're not going to identify truth. We're handing it over to third party fact checkers. Like all the people who got everything wrong in the voice. <laughs> you know, it's going to be guardian readers judging guardian readers. And we know that they're going to be pretty happy with what they see in the guardian. It, uh, um, you know, the, the definition of serious harm is loose. They pretend that it's not going to hit the individual, but they're going to have these codes of conduct that they can apply to social media. It's basically a disaster. Um, so far, I don't think the Liberal Party has been nearly vitriolic enough about contesting this bill. You know, I thought Dutton did OK on The Voice, but he took a year or too long to come out against it. I hope he's not going to wait around too long to come out against this bill. Yeah, maybe the fact their fingerprints were on the original idea um, is is holding them back somewhat. It, it it's interesting that you say that init the initial conception was in response to the government, the then Morrison government, not liking some set some things that were being said about their their COVID policies, and and I see that very much as as part of the new drive for this version of the bill. Um, I'll give you a couple of quotes. These were taken from referendum night from the recent voice referendum in October. Um, the Yes 23 campaign director, Dean Parkin, said that the referendum result was due to, and I quote, 
the single largest misinformation campaign that this country has ever seen. And the, the voice activist Thomas Mayo um, blamed the, again a quote, disgusting no campaign, a campaign that has been dishonest, that has lied to the Australian people. Now, now, normally after, it was a pretty thumping loss. I mean, 60 to 40, um, 60% to 40% is, is about as bad as it gets in Australia. And normally that would instill a bit of introspection and reflection on, 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 on that policy. But instead, the approach has been we lost because of the lies of the, the, the no case. And I don't see, I see that there's a big coincidence, uh, that, that sorry, there's no coincidence between them saying that and the fact that we're getting this misinformation bill, that, uh, that, that, that is, the narrative that the voice was lost because of misinformation is going to be used to, to drive home this new censorship law. Is, is that your take? Well, firstly, I think all of us on the no side need to get down and thank, thank the people who led the yes campaign for being the most incompetent <laughs> people in the history. I mean, I am delighted that yes lost, but I think, John, you and I could have done a better job running the yes campaign. We, first of all, wouldn't have called everyone who disagreed with us a racist, and uh, we wouldn't have run the most incompetent campaign in the history of uh, sort of Australian politics. So maybe we can get these guys to be in charge of getting the disinformation bill through, and then it'll, there's no hope of it getting through that. So that's the first point. Um, secondly, you know, my day job is as a constitutional law professor. I don't think the no campaign said anything that was factually incorrect. They just mm. say it was misinformation. But, you know, you get examples like, uh, oh, uh, when the no people said this is legally risky, that's misinformation. On what basis? Well, they point to the expert panel. All of those people were appointed by Albanese. All of them were in favor of the voice. On the other hand, we have former High Court justices like Ian Callanan. Is he dealing in misinformation when he points out the problems? And when you point out that we have a judiciary that's very activist, that is just a fact. Mm. And this would uh, the voice, had it gone through, would have given them um, new uh, tools. Uh, you know, this expert panel said it wasn't going to give a group right. And no people said, yes, it was. And that was deemed misinformation. Well, it is a group right. You're giving special entitlements to just some people. So again, they can't point to anything other than contested arguments. And then they say, if you disagree, here's their def definition of misinformation. If you disagree with me, that's misinformation. Now, that might be the basis for some people's marriages. I don't want to get that wrong. <laughs> but let's be honest. That is, you know, when you're dealing with contested, leave aside value judgment. So normally the great philosopher David Hume distinguished facts and values, is's and oughts. Even on the level of is, it's not easy to know what the truth is. I, you know, it didn't wasn't clear at the beginning of COVID whether the thing came out of a lab or not. And what they wanted to do was silence one group of people who said it came out of the lab. Now that's the predominant view, by the way. Matt Ridley said had they released all the information, it would have been clear early on that it came out of a lab. And I guess when you think about it, You've got a lab working on this thing in one part of China and nowhere else in the world, and it it's discovered like uh, 25 yards from the door of the lab, and people went, oh, you're a racist if you think it came out of the lab. So, you know, governments have a strong desire to stifle anyone who disagrees with them, and that's on both sides of the political spectrum. But, uh, you know, this, there, as far as I can tell, I can't, no one's pointed to any claims made by the no camp that were clearly factually wrong. You can disagree about what future judges are going to do. You know, there are people who think we're going to have a highly constrained judiciary. That's possible. We haven't seen it in the last 15 years, but it's possible. But when people say, I don't think the judges are going, they're going to use this mm. to become even more activist, that's equally possible. And just because people who are chosen, handpicked by the Albanese government and paid and get the title expert group say something, that doesn't make it true. You know, the Solicitor General was in, led the government in the Love case. He certainly didn't see the result coming from the High Court in the Love case. <laughs> so I have great problems with this idea that some, you know, two-bit little uh, academics at RMIT or somewhere else are going to tell the rest of Australia what's true or not. And then when you leave the realm of fact and move into opinion, 
Like, there's just no way to arbitrate whose opinion is worthier than someone else's. This is why, you know, John Stuart Mill said the, the best way of moving society forward is through the cauldron of competing views. And if you think you're right, go out into the marketplace of views and try to convince, you know, a sufficient number of other people. You're never going to convince everyone. There's people who think the moon landings didn't happen. Mm. I mean, so if, you're, if your criterion is you have to convince everybody in Australia, you can't do that. But normally, over time, you know, the, the stronger view prevails. It doesn't happen right away always. Yeah, I think you've hit on two key problems with, with censorship in general. One is it, it's just a really bad way to establish the truth. The best way to establish the truth is, is, is to have that, you know, the conflict of ideas and, and, and let a good idea be challenged by a bad idea and, and, and the sort of the, the winner prevails. But the, the other one, which it just it just amazes me how how you know one side of politics will, will push for censorship under the assumption that they'll always control the institutions. Because the one of the main problems with um, censorship is who gets to decide, who gets to decide, and and you you've already alluded to it. But I I just want to give a couple of quotes from. A Guardian newspaper article two days before The Voice, um, just to stick on that theme. Um, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't think that there's a world apart between the views of The Guardian newspaper and probably the, the, the public servants that will be running these, these censorship agencies like ACMA. Um, so they had an article that was called Voice referendum, fact-checking the seven biggest pieces of misinformation pushed by the no side. Now, I won't go into all of them, but it includes these three. So there was, these are the three of the biggest pieces of misinformation. The voice is legally risky. The voice will divide the nation. And there is no detail. Now, those three arguments were some of the main arguments pushed by the, the, the no case, you know, the, the, the saying, vote no to the voice of div division or that the government hasn't provided the detail. I, I don't think people quite understand how scary it is to think that if that is the standard of misinformation, if that's what, if, if that's the standard, if that's treated as misinformation and it's these, it's these left-leaning journalists that run these fact-checking outfits and who will be in charge of it, that pretty much the no case, the way it was argued, would be censored from the internet if it was rerun with these new laws in place. I, I find that deeply disturbing. Again, uh, why Mr. Dutton hasn't uh, just raised the red flag on this, I don't know. You always wonder where they pick seven from. Is it like, have they got a commitment to the seven deadly sins? They just <laughs> pluck seven out of the air. But all three of the ones you just uh, voiced, well, the voice was legally risky in my opinion. And I think many, many lawyers thought so too. Barristers were a bit constrained. They make their living in, in front of uh, the judiciary, which disgracefully largely came out for yes. But I certainly got quite a few phone calls from top lawyers saying, look, we can't really say anything, but we're really worried about this. Um, it will divide the nation. It, in losing, it divided the nation. I mean, I don't know how you could say it's misinformation to say that's a real possibility. And uh, it was a lot. There is no detail. Well, Mr. Albanese said we're going to leave it to Parliament later to decide this. Mm. And remember... It would have been a, it would have been a parliament controlled by Labour and the Greens, both houses. So who knows what the detail would have been? It's the only referendum ever where you weren't really getting any detail at all. It's the only referendum I know of. It's the only constitutional amendment I know of anywhere where you didn't need the constitutional amendment to do what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Parliament could set up a statutory voice body tomorrow. They have the power under Section Fifty One. So at, they were actually wanting to put something into the Constitution to enable something they could already do. And they only wanted to do that to make it unfixable and un, you know, deletable. So uh, these, these people who are going to be deemed fact checkers, you know, they get just about everything. They're just articulating left of center views. In the, in the litigation in um, the U.S., in uh, discovery, uh, Meta or whatever you call Facebook admitted that, you know, these are just their opinions. They call it fact checking, but these are just their opinions. Mm -hmm. And this labor government will set up bodies who enforce the sort of 
Guardian left progressive worldview and government will be exempt. Universities, which are equally left, there's basically no conservative, there's no diversity of viewpoint on universities. Um, you know, it's like early Christians in the Roman Empire. And uh, and so, and, and the same is going to go for the legacy press. So, you know, you can't imagine a more orthodox, stifling environment. As you say, I mean, the only good thing about this is I suspect that it just drives everything underground. And, you know, what they're worried about is the sort of fringe nutcases. Well, those people aren't going to be silenced. <laughs> they don't care. Uh, if anything, the fact that you're censoring sensible views, like this is risky, is going to uh, give a gloss of respectability to the loonier views, you know, because you're cens censoring just in the long term is a bad strategy for everybody. Yeah, you, you mentioned the West. It seems like across the West, there's there's this tendency for governments, a knee-jerk reaction to things they don't like is, is censorship. So we're seeing that in recent weeks in Ireland where there have been um, some, some mass protests against government immigration policy. And the government's response is to propose new hate speech laws and to launch an investigation against one of the, 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 the prominent critics, you know, the, the UFC fighter, Conor McGregor. Um, the West used to be the bastion of free speech. It, it used to be the area, the, the place in the world where there was a commitment to protecting free speech. You're, you're from Canada. You've, you've studied extensively the legal systems across, across the Anglosphere. Um, is there a decline in respect for free speech across the West, and, and why is this happening? Well, firstly, just as an aside, back in the 1300s, if you were accused of an offence, you could opt for trial by combat. I think Conor <laughs> McGregor would do pretty well under <laughs> trial by combat. I'm not, I'm not seeing him convicted of anything under the uh, trial by combat uh, route. But uh, it is a problem, and it's a problem around the English. For some reason, the English here used to do better than the rest of the uh, democratic world. And in, in the last 20 years, we're doing worse. In the U.S., it's now become plain that the Biden administration was uh, coordinating with the social media companies to censor views during COVID. Uh, there's lawsuits that are some of the Republican state attorneys general have launched. I think those are going to win. I think when you get to the, you know, provided they can get to the Supreme Court soon enough, I think, you know, that is a, it's not a breach of the First Amendment for the social media companies to do that. I think they need to change that law. But once you can draw a link with government, government is not allowed in the U.S. to pick sides. That's why they did it covertly. So free speech is under threat in the U.S. Um, it's, it's worse in the U.K. Some of the, the Public Order Act and some of those, you know, and the way and, you know, again, the way policing has been done, it hasn't been even handed policing. You've got police in here in Australia, you know, they're kneeling and celebrating with Black Lives Matter protests. But anti-COVID protests, they're just mm. thugs. They're beating people up, kicking them in the head, arresting a pregnant woman and handcuffing her in her home. You know, I grew up in the most pro-police, middle-class Toronto family. Mm. I went through law school as the biggest defender of the police. I think most of my time as a law professor. But the last three years has really put me off the police because they have been a disgrace. They're here. I mean, not every police officer, but the, the sort of one-sidedness of what they're doing. And in Britain, we've seen it with, you know, the way they went after Tommy Robinson. And they're just not treating Gaza protesters the way they're treating other protesters. Or, you know, one guy waves an Israeli flag and he's the guy who's arrested. Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking, like, what is going on with the police officers? You want a cause. Well, clearly one long-term cause is that the left has taken over most of the cultural institutions. You know, I work in universities and these are dominated by the left. You come into work every morning wondering whether they've added a new flag to the registry building, you know. Are they going to try to get up to seven? You know, that's the magic number for the left, seven. How many <laughs> How many flags do we need? Um, the one they'd like to get rid of is the Australian flag, but they haven't been able to do that yet. So uh, universities are a problem because many students just don't get exposed to, you know, forget right of center views. Let's take views that might align with Bill Shorten. Even those views, they're not exploring, you know, the sort of right side of the Labour Party. 
I think to some extent you could make a pretty strong case that in many ways multiculturalism has failed and governments are so afraid of, you know, these ID group identities that they've imported into the country. And, you know, some cultures do better than others. Some have, uh, you know, fit in with Western standards and some haven't. And if your first response is you can't say that or we're going to kill you, that's not a that's not doesn't fit in very well with a sort of enlightenment Western view. In some ways, multiculturalism has scared the bejesus out of governments. Ireland's a perfect example. And the short term fix is to try to stop people from talking. Mm. Because if they talk, they're going to point out that we have been we are the sort of political caste over the last 20 or 30 years has failed voters in, in the Western world. We have been completely let down by our political caste. They won't take on the difficult issues and they don't want to be criticized and they don't want to upset this sort of state of affairs they've created. So I don't know, there's probably myriad causes. No, no one really knows how these things all factor in, but the commitment people have to free speech is not what it was. It used to be when I went through university in the 80s, the left, the left wing, you know, the sort of American Civil Liberties Union, they were the they had the commitment to free speech. They went out and defended the Nazis walking through Skokie, you know, these despicable people. But it was the left who said, let them speak. The American Civil Liberties Union today is just a left. They, they don't care about free speech. They've just become a left wing political organization. So the odd thing is you've now got conservatives on the right who are the supporters of free speech. That was never the case in the 60s and 70s. You know, there, there might have been a commitment to free speech, but the really strong commitment came from the political left. That's just gone. It's gone. I mean, there's some dinosaurs around. Mm. And oddly enough, some of the uh, some of the strongest supporters for free speech on the left are the really old fashioned redistribution of wealth, hard left people. I have certain affinity with them. You know, I think they're mm. they're just wrong on the economy. Mm. But they're, you know, they're solid on just not lying about what's in front of their eyes and and wanting a, a, a competition of ideas and that that sort of thing. Yeah, getting to that ACLU. I mean, it's just un, it would be unfathomable today that they would represent Nazis. It's it's, yeah. it's um, we can't I, even get we can't even get barristers in the ACT to you know it was really hard for Bruce Lehrman to get represented. You know what happened to criminal. Criminal barristers used to be the rock solid presumption of innocent people. Yeah. You know, now they're afraid to take cases. Oh, what happened I mean, to the cab rank rule? You know, the ACT yeah. uh, criminal justice system is is in very bad shape. I, I, I was it, it's better I, in other parts of the country. Well, not in Victoria probably, but everywhere else yeah. it's better. I, I was pretty distressed by the group think during the voice of the legal profession. Um I would have thought the default position for lawyers is to just to to be aloof from the debate, um, and unless constitutional scholars may be accepted, but the way law firms felt the need to to bend the knee to yep. to, to to get on board, um, and the and the the, the, the bar societies. Um, John, if you yeah. want some of the most woke workplaces in Australia. Go to the biggest law firms in Sydney and walk in the door. You better have a pronoun on your chest. I mean, these places are run by their HR departments. And I think what many people don't realize, it hasn't hit them yet. 50, 60 yeah. years ago, the median lawyer, his or her views was to the political right of the median yep. voter. Today, they're not just to the, the left of the median voter. They're an order of magnitude to the left of the you know, median voter. And the same goes for wealthy people. I mean, if you look and see where the voice succeeded, it was in the wealthiest constituencies and, and polling booths in Australia. Wealthy people around the Anglosphere now vote left, green mm. left. Mm. And so that's the sort of coalition that uh, you're seeing on the right. You're seeing a new coalition. It doesn't involve wealthy corporate types. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the coalition that Boris put together in 2019 and then threw away. It's the coalition that Trump put together in 2016 and could win next year. I think he's got a really good chance. It's what Paul Ev's doing in, in, in Canada, you know, the new Tory leader who's very good. And basically what they're saying is that the so-called teal seats in Australia, you're never winning those back by aiming to cater to them. You might win them back if there's a, you know, a financial meltdown because 
whatever else you say about wealthy people, they care about their pocketbook. But uh, basically, if you cater your policies to them, they can afford crazy net zero policies. They don't mm. care about free speech. They've got money and the policies don't really hit them. And so that's not a winning coalition for the right of center. Your winning coalition is the rural, suburban, outer, and it turns out middle and lower working class people who, you know, care about culture and care about free speech. And, mm. you know, that's the massive winning coalition that I think we're going to see in the election in Canada coming up in the U.S. Yeah. The Tories in Britain are going to be obliterated because they completely ignored that coalition. The people who voted them in, you know, for 13 mm. years, the Tory party in Britain has promised to lower immigration and every single year it's gone up. They are now the highest taxing government since the war. They have mm. been a complete failure on their own terms. Every single promise they've made to their voters, they haven't been able to fulfill. When the judges step in and use the European Convention to block them, they do nothing. They could resile from the convention anytime they want. Some of my, my, my friends on the sort of more conservative side complain about Australian state of free speech and culture and complain about the Liberal Party. I, I always point them to the United Kingdom and the, the Conservative worse. parties. Worse. It's, it's much worse. Um, but you can fix it, John, because it was worse in Canada and then they got Paul Lev and he's been a sort of a revelation. Now, what the Tories realized in Canada is you cannot let the MPs pick the leader. I know back in Churchill's day, it worked great. You know, you let the party room pick the leader but it doesn't work anymore. Now, this guy, Paul Yev, the MPs in the party room would have walked over broken glass to stop him from getting the leadership. He was like a Tony Abbott on steroids. <laughs> and, you know, he has taken them from way behind. Right now, they're 15 points up in the polls. He says he's going to cut a billion dollars off the CBC budget. Can you imagine Simon Birmingham standing up and saying we're going to cut a billion dollars off the you know, the ABC budget? No, we need to move to uh, the party members picking the leaders because that would fix many of the problems overnight. It would get rid of the sort of te Mark Texter view of how you run campaigns. It would get rid of these factional people outside of politics who, you know, seem to be in love with net zero. And it would open up free speech. And uh, I think it would be a renaissance. I know some of the older politicians, and I like John Howard, but he's just wrong on this one. He thinks that uh, leaving it to the party room, you know, the party room got rid of Tony Abbott. They still haven't recovered from that. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it was the worst decision ever. And it, it, they would have been much better off to let Abbott lose. I think Abbott would have won. But if they'd lost, they still would have been better off than what they did. They have never recovered. You know, people forget something like a third of voters don't preference labor or the lips. Mm. That's a huge percentage. If we didn't have a terrible voting system, which is a protection racket for the two main parties, <laughs> and there's only two countries in the world that use our voting system, us and some island in the South Pacific, I think it's Vanuatu, it could be, I could have that one wrong. You know, it basically forces you to pick one of the two main parties. You, you cannot do a protest vote. And so first past the post lets you do a protest vote. And so do proportional systems. And we're stuck with this system where you just basically have to pick between the two parties. And in many ways, they don't offer any differences at all. So we, you know, I'd get rid of preferential voting the first chance I got. But it's impossible to do that because it favors both the main parties. Mm. And so they have no incentive, none, to get rid of it. You've mentioned a few times um, the drift of the elites to the left and, and I, I see that as, um, as not being a coincidence with the, the rise of um, censorship. It, it, it seems to me that a lot of the ideas that are being pushed by the modern left don't age well with more exposure to sunlight. I mean, it was, I mean the, the voice was a great example. I mean, it started off very an emotional, feel-good idea that, that was was smashing it in the polls. And the more people learn about it, um, the, the more they didn't like it. I think you could apply that theory to climate change, gen gender theory, and a number of other, um, uh, you know, uh, ideologies being pushed um, by the left. It's because if there is a free 
fair debate on some of these ideas. Um, and, and if we had a fairer media and a, a better political system that more was more open, like what you've described, more open to, to debate rather than conformity, um, I think that would go a long way to, to pushing back from some of those ideas. And so there's no, no surprise that the, those promoting those ideas consider that that sort of debate and scrutiny is hate speech or misinformation or racism or whatever other label they want to give it. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think so. I think we're seeing that a bit with uh, Twitter now called X. You know, if you look, they did a study, you look at TikTok and Facebook, the amount of anti-Semitism on that dwarfs what you see on X. But some of the big corporations are pulling their advertising from X because of a couple mm. of comments Musk made. <laughs> and he points out, you know, we are, wh why aren't you pulling your advertising from Facebook and TikTok, which are far worse, if that's your only criterion. I mean, in some ways, we're very lucky that this billionaire Musk bought Twitter because it has mm. turned Twitter at least into uh, one of the sort of most open fora or forums. I never know if that's a false lot in plural. Let's say, <laughs> let's say it's fora. I'm not really sure. Uh, open fora <laughs> for uh, discussion. So he uh, he's done us all a favor. But when you've got the money and the resources, like some of our corporate class, they they could stand up against this and they don't. And they were pathetic during the voice. You know, they they just rolled over like mm. a wet noodle. Gina Reinhart accepted. She was she was good. But by and large, they've just been pathetic. And the good thing about Musk is he just says, uh, well, I'm not doing that. And that's great, you know, stand on principle. And, you know, he's trying to keep it an open form. He's not perfect. I don't think it's perfect, but it's way better than it was. And we found out a lot of things we wouldn't have known that were going on about the laptop, you know, the Hunter Biden laptop and the extent to which the security services in the Washington, D.C. bureaucracy before the 2020 election took steps to try to help Biden win. Well, we would have never found this out. And, and, you know, to this day, the legacy media, Fox News exempted, uh, just doesn't talk about it at all. Mm. You know, they knew it was actually his laptop well a year before the election. And you had 41, 42, I forget mm. what it was, intelligence officers signing this letter that was carefully worded to make it sound like it was Russian disinformation. There's that word again. You know? mm. Yeah. So, uh you know, in some ways, if Trump wins next year, it's going to be delightful just to, because I think he's learned. Uh, and, you know, he came in as a top sort of corporate type. He's learned that you can't really trust the Washington bureaucracy. They will do everything they can to undermine a conservative leader. One of the things that's happened is you know, I, I used to spend time in New Zealand. On, uh, I joined this thing called New Zealand Skeptics. We used to mock people who were against vaccines. But this new vaccine is not like old vaccines. You know, if you got rubella or chickenpox, almost no one then went on to get chickenpox. <laughs> mm. This MNRA, mRNA vaccine, it's not like those other vaccines. It's much more dubious. It might work for people over 60, but, you know, they, they ran abbreviated trials and it didn't stop people from getting it and it didn't stop people from transmitting it. And it's clearly some evidence that it's causing heart problems and stuff and they don't want people to talk about that but it's had this horrible effect in the u.s now where a the uptake on the latest covid vaccine is like laughably risibly small five percent or something and it's affecting people taking other vaccines well this is mm. what john stewart mill would have predicted yep if you're yep. going to lie to people or you're going to block people from you know articulating you know evidence of dangers they will just stop trusting you on anything. And, yeah. you know, you know, other vaccines are great. They even changed the definition of vaccine during the early part of COVID. It didn't used to cover this MNRA thing. It would have been sort of like a flu shot. Mm. So they changed the definition. And you ought to be able to articulate skepticism because if you block that, it's not just going to stop there. People are going to think the public health cast is in bed with government. And it was. Mm. And, you know, just go and read the kind of horror stories that happened to Stanford's Jay Bhattacharya or Sunetra Gupta at Oxford. She's like probably the world's leading epidemiologist. She was censored. She was ridiculed because she was right on just about everything. The people who wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, they were right. 
You know, we now have terrible excess death statistics. No one's talking about it. The ABC isn't running a daily death count. You know, every time you turn on the ABC, and I apologize to your viewers for even expressing the idea that they might turn on the ABC. I gave that up a while ago. But, you know, for anybody out there who's still crazy enough to turn on the ABC, you know, they just, you know, they were propaganda agents during COVID. So all these things are connected. You have to have confidence that there is an open discussion of, you know, views. I, I think that's the the ultimate irony of these misinformation laws is that it relies on experts, a government agency or expert fact checkers to determine what we're allowed to see online when trust and confidence in experts has never been lower. Uh, in journalism, unfortunately now because of COVID very much in the medical profession, foreign, uh, foreign affairs bureaucracy, of, it's been disaster after disaster across the West. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, of all the times in history where you might um, have some cause to say, um, oh, maybe society would be, be would benefit from certain content not being available and, and we're going to appoint some experts to determine that. <laughs> this is the worst time in history because they have totally, totally such agree. a track record of, of failure. Um, and, and Jim, you know, John, uh, there's, a sec there's a second order issue to that because I completely agree with you. But in the, you know, back and forth of uh, politics, when the libs get in, they don't need to get their appointments through the Senate. You know, they appoint lousy appointments. They appoint lefty mm. progressive people. The uh, Australian Human Rights Commission, every member was appointed by the Libs. They mm. didn't say a word during the two and a half years of COVID. And now they're pushing a Bill of Rights. You know, mm. the worst thing ever for a conservative <laughs> government. And so for nine years of coalition government, they, they appointed every one of those people. It's the Liberal government who's appointed the majority of the High Court that gave us the Love decision. And the Vanderstock decision that undermined federalism and the latest ones releasing these people. These are, you know, you cannot, I, I don't know what's wrong with the right side of politics. Douglas Murray talks about this in Britain. They would rather walk over glass than appoint actual conservatives to anything because then when they go to their dinner parties, they might be criticized. You know, I would put Andrew Bolt in charge of, I'd make him the managing editor of the ABC. You know, that's somebody who might <laughs> yeah. shake things up. They won't do that. Again, they appointed both the managing editor and the chief executive or the chairman of, of ABC. These have been terrible appointments. Yeah. And they just, they would rather die almost than appoint actual conservatives to anything. And so you, you've got the second order problem that if you're going to hand it over to these sort of Congo bureaucratic elites, you can't even trust their conservative side of politics to appoint anybody who might stand up for the right of center. Where was where was a you know a Australian Human Rights Commission that faced with what Lord Sumption called the worst inroads on in our civil liberties in two or three hundred years? Mm. Where were they? They didn't say anything. But you mm. know, some somebody claiming to be a refugee slips slips through the net and gets a oh well the whole force of the Australian Human Rights Commission bringing their you know multi billion dollar budget to bear, and then what do they all get paid? I don't know four or five hundred grand. So yeah. we can't make appointments on our side of politics. And this is a problem not just in Australia, but around the Angsphere, although it's less of a problem in the U.S. Um, because at the state level, Texas, Florida, they do make good appointments. And it sounds like Paulie Ever in Canada is going to just ignore all of the wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know, there is no conservative media in Canada. There's nothing like the Spectator or even the Australian. And people say, oh, well, you can't do a Donald Trump without Fox News. But you can. Mm. Because Paulie Eva is more articulate than Trump. And he, he challenges journalists. And, you know, it's going to be, I don't know if he's going to live up to his promise if he gets elected. But it will be a delight if his first uh, bill says we're taking a billion dollars off the CBC <laughs> budget. You know, they're, they, they would be on, I don't know, $1.6 billion a year or I guess the ABC here gets what you'd know better, $1.2 billion a year, uh, something like that. Yeah, so, about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they'd be down to nothing. Yeah. And uh, that would be great. <laughs> and people say, oh, you know, you can't do that. But it turns out that when you say that, it's incredibly popular. 
Poiliev is 14 points ahead of Trudeau with, I don't know, a year and a half to go. Now, you know, who knows what will happen in the next year and a half. But it's taken quite a while for people to realize that this strategy of softly, softly, don't challenge labor or don't challenge the left on anything, it doesn't work. It's a terrible strategy. You know, that that whole sort of Mark Texter strategy never was convincing. And uh, it, it's just not working anywhere. Whereas when you go out and challenge the core views that you don't agree with, well, and, you know, it's like people said, oh, if, if you took the Mark Texter strategy, you'd say, well, the voice was at 70% when it was announced. So we can't fight it. Focus groups say 70%. So we just have to do it. We can maybe tinker with it. But if you go out and you get a Jacinda Price and you say, here's why it's a bad idea. Here's the dangers. And here are all the potential problems. You go from 70% in favor down to 40. Mm. Well, that's that's what politics is about. You know, anybody can run a focus group. Well, one one advantage of um, there being such a, a paucity of um, conservative views in mainstream media is it does um, push people to to look at alternatives such as as this program. Mm. On, on that, Jim, um, I just want to thank you so much for your time. You've been extremely generous, as well as being a very articulate speaker on John, a number of topics. John, I wasn't meaning to use the word paucity. It was you. <laughs> you can't get past paucity. That's a fantastic sort of word. So I, I feel I defer to you on the uh, vocabulary front. Well, and you're also an excellent um, writer. I love reading everything um, you write from from detailed legal um, uh, review articles to, 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 to spectator articles. Um, how can people find out more about you, Jim? Well, thank you for that. That sounds like my mum wrote that little spiel at the end, John, so thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, so I write weekly for The Spectator and for a few other things. I don't really do social media. I feel that uh, when you work in a university with my views, it would just be uh, a source of having a heart attack. So uh, I, I try to avoid it. That way I don't know what anyone's saying. Uh, <laughs> and anyway, you know, the thing about social media is you know, even old fashioned print journalism is incredibly ethereal. You know, you try to think of a great journalist who stood the test of time, you know, maybe H.L. Mencken in the U.S. You know, he was a great journalist. But how many people read H.L. Mencken today? Hardly anyone. And you can't think of a journalist whose, you know, views last more than, uh, you know, a microsecond. Alistair Cook, perhaps. I grew up uh, listening to him every week a letter from america but again how many young people would even know who alistair cook mm. was nobody really so by its nature journalism is ethereal and social media just takes that on steroids so mm. uh people get all worked up about it but you know it's it's got no staying power and uh, so you you shouldn't get too worked up about it and you add to that the the average view you get on uh, social media is to the is probably in line. They did a study with the most left wing uh, district in Congress, you know, somewhere in Hawaii or California. Uh, it it doesn't represent anything, and so people and politicians particularly should stop worrying so much. I know young advisors all they all they do is look on social media, but that's worthless. It's it's close to worthless. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, and I don't see why they can't just say, look, we're gonna we're gonna run a long term attempt to change people's views. We can do it. We saw we did it with The Voice. Um, so I, I prefer writing for the magazine and Quadrant. I find it harder to get into the Australian than I used to. I used to be regular, but I find the Australian has moved left a bit, to be totally honest. I don't know what other people take on that. Still pretty good, but definitely has moved left. I'm sad about that. Um, and then some other sites, wow. Daily Skeptic, Conservative Woman. I don't know how they define woman, but since it's conservative, it's probably based on your chromosomes. Well, that's the Australians lost, Jim. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, yeah, keep uh, fighting the good fight and look forward to hearing more about what you're doing in the future. Mm -hmm.